I create ceramic sculptures, uh, usually with an architectural theme, sometimes with a machine theme, and sometimes with a robotic theme. The reason I work with, with clay is because it's elemental and childlike. I think there's an intrinsic thing or an intuitive thing that goes on with the material that an artist chooses to work with. I think entropy plays a big part in my work because I just it's a fascinating word and it means going from an organized state to an unorganized state. And you know, it's, it's, in a way, as soon as you're born, you're going from an organized state to an unorganized state. A lot like that's why I was attracted to the barns. Because at one time the barns were fresh and brand new and they stood up straight. And just through time they're slowly dissolving and falling apart. And you know, I enjoy looking at buildings, I enjoy the battle against that, you know, in my own self and in in the buildings that I look at and the, the objects the objects that I make. I guess it's a way of coping with, with getting older and the own, the, our own entropy that happens to us. I guess it's just a way of dealing with it. The emotion that I'm feeling when I'm making my work usually it evolves around humor. Like how much can I get that row house to lean over without falling, falling over completely? When I show my work to, 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 to kids, it's like, you know, when they see a barn that's falling down, they think it looks funny or, or sad or, or, or scary. So there's a lot of different emotions I try to plug into. Oh, well, the value that I place in, in my art is uh, you know, with the barns, it's like it's recording of the, the world that I, that I live in. Um, and I, I'm, I feel like I'm paying you know, homage to my environment. Now, when I go to New Jersey to visit the in-laws, we get into to the cities, and there I'm just reflecting a lot of the big buildings the, the, or the brownstones that I, um, that I see when we go to New York City. And then when it comes to the factories, the factories are um, a result of you know, being raised in uh, Akron, Ohio, and I'm kind of paying homage to where I was, where I was born and raised. I think the pedal cars are my favorite things to build. Akron used to be the tire capital of the world, and we were, you know, pretty close to Detroit. So, and just being a guy, I always loved cars. I mean, if I was on a desert island by myself, it would, you know, I had pedal car bodies with me, I would, I would do pedal cars. I'm fascinated by them because, you know, they're a toy. There was a, they're a toy that you used to ride in, at least when I was a kid. And when you're riding in them as a kid, it's like you're taking this toy and in your mind, it's, you're making it into an adult thing. You're making it into a real car. And as an adult, when we're driving around in our real cars, to a lot of us, you know, your car's kind of like a toy. You know, so I just, I just like that kind of, that strange connection. When I'm surfing through eBay for other things, I, you know, just, I came across the pedal cars and they were all, you know, rusty and the rust looked like about the same shade of brown as my clay. And I figured, figured boy, they, they might look pretty together. And so I, you know, I bid on a couple of bodies and I'm just, I'm, I'm getting the bodies that are all trashed out that nobody else wants, so I'm getting, getting them for a good price. And I just, out of the clay, I started making the mechanicals. You know, the tires and the transmission and the engines and just, you know, as many parts as I could. I'll have the dashboard open and there'll be things stuffed in, into the dashboard, like uh, into the glove box, rather, like an old pen or a spiral notebook. Things that will trigger nostalgia in whoever's viewing it.
A lot of my work has a steampunk theme. And steampunk is a name of an art movement that happened in the early 80s. It's speculative fiction. It's in the late 80s, um, people were starting to write novels again that were like Wells or Jules Verne. And, but in this case, it was like the technology never advanced along with time, so things are, are, are driven by big, heavy steam machinery. Com you know, you may have a computer, but it's like it's running on steam. Um, transportation is, is, is steam driven. And you know, things are big and clunky, so I was attracted to the, how that looked, the stylized uh, parts of steampunk, especially because bolts, big and heavy, a lot like my machinery. I started thinking about what would be the things that would least likely be, you know, made out of those big heavy materials. And, you know, I figured, well, I'll, robots would be interesting thinking about, uh, about the, the, the steampunk theme. Um, and that's where, like, the machinery came from also. I started making robots to put a human face on my work. And I, you know, people really respond to the human form. They respond to, 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 to the face and, and fa facial features. The eyeballs that I use to animate the robots, they come from Van Dyke's taxidermy up in South Dakota. And there's value to me in calling up South Dakota and talking with the sales staff, you know, because I will call up and I'll, I'll order eyeballs that are just all over the place. It, it, it wouldn't make any sense for someone to call them up if they're doing taxidermy to get alligator eyes and then lion eyes, small pupil, and then, you know, wildebeest eyes, large pupil. The staff gets, um, they, they get a kick out of it because you know eventually they'll get around to well you know what exactly are you doing you know they're probably not supposed to be asking customers what they're doing with the eyeballs and then you know i'm end up i'm, I'm sending them images of what i'm doing with them and then they kind of they'll go out of your, their way if you need a specialized eyeball which i, I which i i needed one time um, they'll go ahead and you know they'll paint a round pupil out of the largest you know, blank that they have. Um, so, I mean, they'll go, they'll go out of their way to help me. The teeth come from dental labs. And I just epoxy them in uh, to my robot head jars and to the robot heads too that are, I don't think I have any full-size robots that have the teeth in them yet, but I'm sure it's coming. And also a, a, a source for a lot of these found parts that make their way into my sculptures is my studio is right next to Recycle North, and I go over there every day. I scan it every day to looking for doodads or whatever uh, that I can work into my art. Mm -hmm. And as a result, I've, I've come back with beauty salon chairs for, from a regular full-size beauty salon and end up you know, putting robots in them. It, everything started with the buildings because um, well, my dad was always talking about you know, the big Victorian houses that he grew up in, with the big porches and how he would go up into the attic and listen to the Green Hornet and these old fashioned radio programs. So that got me interested in architecture, I believe. But when I got to college and had to do a hand building assignment, the first thing I made was a house. Just living in Vermont, surrounded by all these barns, is inspirational. I mean, that's the first thing I noticed when I moved to Vermont. It looked like they were made out of clay to begin with, being all wonky and curvy and slouching. So I figured, well, I'll, I'll replicate that out of clay. One of the reasons I don't treat the surface of my clay sculptures is that I don't want to end up relying on color or glaze to pick up any inadequacies in the design. 
If you know you're not using color, then the form of the sculpture has to be really strong to, to make it look good enough you know, for, for sculpture. In place of color, I will use the, the brick texture to you know, set up an area of contrast next to a smooth area. I'll punch windows into the, the row houses so you get a nice dark area deep inside the, the building, which you know, the shadows are in there are, are, end up being pretty dramatic and, and graphic. It does, sometimes it does get monotonous to look at all this work and it's just monochromatic. So how could I add color without treating the surface area? And that's where the valve handles, the colorful wires, um, the little adding machine buttons off of, any, uh, off of vintage adding machines come from. That's, that's a way, especially with the machinery, that I can add color without, without treating the, the surface of the sculptures. For the most part, I'm creating for myself, and if I'm lucky enough, other people will like it and they'll, and they'll buy it. But for the most part, I'm making what I would want to see if I walked into a gallery.